Hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today I'm with Mike Newman, who's going to field your questions about the ARE. Uh, some of the topics that he's going to cover include strategies for the transition from ARE uh, 4 to 5, um, some study resources and strategies, uh, a, little bit of, um, a little bit of content about the interior layout vignette, and then also some questions about lighting and about um, choices between wood species. Uh, so that's what we're going to cover today. Before we get started, uh, if you'd like to attend our next ARE Live broadcast, uh, which will be on the structural systems exam uh, in September, visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. Uh, during the broadcast, you'll have, chance, uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions uh, and share your answers with Mike. We'll very likely um, issue a mock exam for that one, so it'll be a really good one uh, for you to kind of test your... Um, your knowledge about uh, about structures. Um, now, if you don't know Mike, he's an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also the founder of Shed Studio, and he is the instructor for Black Spectacles online AIA ARE prep curriculum, which if you haven't already checked out our AIA ARE prep curriculum, head over to blackspectacles.com to watch any of the free tutorials from the courses. Um, and today we have a very special Black Spectacles promo code to share, so make sure you stick around until the end of today's episode. Uh, but first, let's hand it over to Mike. Thanks, Mark. Uh, first off, we have uh, a whole bunch of really great questions that got sent in to us. But before we get into that, I just wanted to mention uh, one of the things Mark and I were just talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, the NCARB has recently updated their exam guides, which means that they have uh, kind of a new take on uh, how the questions are going to work, and they're kind of simplifying a bunch of the questions. Now, are they really simpler or not? That's another thing. But uh, you should absolutely go and check out their new sample questions and download some of the, the exam guides just to see how they're thinking about the questions and the process these days, especially as we build up towards uh, the transition to 5.0, which we'll talk about more later. Uh, just kind of getting an understanding of how they're thinking about uh, how these uh, exam questions get made and, and the way that you should be responding to them. So simplifying the questions, having a new batch of questions, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's there that's uh, worth checking out. Okay, uh, this is one that's causing a lot of uh, nervousness and consternation. Um, so. What about the ARE 5.0? Does it make sense to start the process now under 4.0, or should you wait for the new version to start uh, when it comes out online? Um, there's a lot to say about this. Uh, so the first thing to say is 5.0, uh, so we're in 4.0 now. Uh, 4.0 became the going concern a few years ago. Before that, it was 3.1. Before that, it was 3.0. Um, uh, and so they, they periodically will change the exam. And there's a bunch of reasons why they do it. Uh, this one is actually a pretty big change, going from 4.0 to 5.0. It's, a, uh, in my mind, a much bigger change than 3.1 to 4.0. Uh, but as I said, the content, the actual questions, like, you know, architecture isn't wildly different. Uh, it's not like safety has changed. It's not like uh, uh, structures has changed. Um, and so the, the gist of this is it's still the same exam. It's just organized differently. So given that, I don't think there's any reason to wait until 5.0. I think you absolutely might as well dive in now. Uh, there there's plenty of opportunity to be able to do this exam under 4.0 uh, and get it done before 5.0 is, is foisted on you. So a couple things to say about that. 5.0 is going to start in late 2016. Um, we've heard a couple different dates. It's probably November or something like that. Um, they, they'll give us a, a hard date probably sometime in February or March. Um, but it's going to start late in 2016. So for one, right off the bat, you've got a fair amount of time between now and then before 5.0 even starts. But then not only that, but there'll be a, a very extensive period of time where both 4.0 and 5.0 are offered. And so uh, 
you will have the ability to uh, stay in 4.0 all the way up through 2018. Uh, I'm not sure the exact uh, final month, but it's probably uh, late fall, something like that in 2018. So you actually have quite a bit of time. Now, this is one of those moments where uh, all the old guys get to say, you know, in my day, uh, but it is actually a useful reminder. Uh, back when I took the exam, I took the exam when it was a pencil and paper thing originally, um, and we took it in four straight days. Uh, the exam isn't really any different. Uh, it's the same content. Now, there's a bunch of big advantages about why it makes sense to take one at a time and to, uh, you know, do these things uh, in sort of logical, you know, really prepare for them and then take one and, and, and move through it. But, you know, think of all the folks in your office who, who became licensed and they could do it in four days. Uh, you know, you can do this one a month uh, and, and get through it. And if you fail a couple, big deal, you retake them and, okay, instead of seven months it takes, uh, you know, eight months, nine months, ten months or something. That's well, well, well within the timeline of being able to do it under 4.0. So I highly recommend doing it under 4.0. Um, the, the one big change, uh, so there's, well, there's two, two changes. There's sort of a, a format um, of like how the, the content is being broken up. Um, it, it, so right now, the 4.0 system, you know, you have say, um, uh, you have say uh, structures, right? So we say structures uh, and that's in a silo. And then we have systems and that's in a silo. And then we have contracts. And that one's not quite as in a silo because it's a little mixed together, but that's in, a, in its own silo. So I can just go and study structures for a month and then take the exam. I can study systems for a month and then take the exam. I can study the contracts and then take that, take that exam. Uh, in the new version, 5.0, it's going to be, it's, this is a little bit of a, it's not quite like this, but essentially it's going to be more about the process, the timeline, of a project. So there'll be stuff that happens uh, early. Then there's gonna be kind of, uh, so early meaning before any of the design work happens. Then there's gonna be kind of the things that happen around SD, pre preliminary design and schematic design. Then there's gonna be things that happen when you're starting to do detailing and uh, design development and that kind of thing. Then there's gonna be uh, you know, construction administration type stuff. So it's more, it's grouped in these other, other ways, right? Um, and what that means is, it's, so it's, like I said, it's still the same basic topics, but it now means that you know, I might have a structural question that's uh, about pre-design. It's about before you even start. Maybe the, the owner hands you a, a, a survey and a geotech information about the soils, and what did it tell you about where the likely place you should be building is, right? So that's a structural question in that first one. Well, there could clearly be a structural question under SD about uh, you know, some sort of uh, idea of uh, um, spans or kind of the basic uh, framing plan for, for a, a building design. And then under CDs, you could have a structural question about uh, you know, how the detailing works or uh, you know, where the rebar goes in concrete. Uh, and then you could have uh, something about how the engineers uh, uh, impact a, a change order or um, how the, the payouts go. Uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, sort of different kind of structural issues uh, in the CA portion. So, in other words, you, you're not going to have that sort of siloed effect where I can just study structures for a short period of time. You're actually going to have to be thinking about structures all the way along. Now, we could say the same thing about contracts. We could say the same thing about systems. We could say the same thing about all of those different elements. They, they will all be through all of them. So, to me, 5.0, uh, I think that's a good idea. I'm glad NCARB is doing that. I think it makes a lot of sense. I just don't know if it makes your life easier when you're studying. Uh, there's something about just being able to um, uh, focus on one issue 
at a time and just knock it off your list, uh, that seems pretty advantageous to me. Uh, so there's a big advantage in my mind to 4.0. The obvious big disadvantage to 4.0 is that uh, it includes the vignettes. And you know, God bless them, NCARB has tried so hard to do this stuff reasonably, uh, but the vignettes are really kind of ridiculous. Um, and uh, they, people get messed up just using the, the program, they don't know how much to practice, it, it, you have to spend time just learning a new program, which obviously isn't really about showing that you know the content and will make a good architect. Um, so there's a lot of trouble with the vignettes. Uh, and it's, I think it's great that the vignettes are going away under 5.0. It's, I think it's about time. Uh, however, the vignettes are the devil you know, right? There's something you can actually study for. People have there's a lot of information out there about how, how best to respond to them. It's easy to make a mistake on one of the vignettes, but it's the, the gist of the scene is one that you can figure out. Uh, whereas under 5.0, with this new strategy, they're going to have a whole bunch of very, very complicated question systems. Uh, under 5.0, they're going to start doing these things where, which again, I think is good, but uh, I don't know that it makes your life easier. They're going to start doing these things that like they'll give you a bit of a drawing and they'll give you a bit of a spec and then a bit of a piece of code or zoning code or building code or something. And then they might ask 10 different questions about that grouping. Well, that sounds interesting to me, but I don't know that it's easier to study for. So. All this to say, I would just stick with 4.0 and belt it out and try to get it done under 4.0. Uh, but one of the big things is if you are going to be, uh, if you are thinking about it or you're starting to get worried about it, be strategic. So let me jump to the next page. Uh, many of you have probably seen this before. Uh, there's, uh, we, we have another um, uh, uh, video uh, about it. Um, so here we are, here are the new 5.0s. So this is all the 5.0 ones. We have one, two, three, four, five, and six. Here are the uh, existing 4.0 ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is sort of odd. These dots represent the sort of content areas. areas. Um, I actually think this is not a particularly accurate uh, version of the content areas of the 7 of 4.0. I think they're actually more mixed than this. Uh, however, this is the one, this is the system that they are using. This is their official version of what the, the contact, content mix is. And if you look at this, you very quickly will realize that if you, uh, under 4.0, take those three so that's construction documents and services, programming planning and practice, and site planning and design. There's that whole big bunch of uh, content that you've got taken care of. And the only content you have left, the only content areas you have left, are those, which is for project planning and design, and project development and documentation. So very oddly, if you're being very strategic about it, you can manage to take a 7-exam 4.0 and transition in the middle to a 6-exam 5.0 by doing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 exams. How weird is that? Uh, so there you go. If you're being strategic, uh, at the very least, when you're starting under 4.0, if you're just starting now, definitely do these three first. Get those done, and then that allows you to then make a decision about whether you want to stay in 4.0 or jump to 5.0. So going down to five exams seems like a kind of a nice thing and a good idea, but like I say, to me, it's still the devil you know. Uh, I still think it's going to be easier for you just to bang them out under 4.0. But at the very least, be strategic. Start with uh, construction documents, services, program planning and practice, and site design, uh, because site planning, because that's, that's the, the key into transitioning. All these other ones, you're going to have to do uh, retake the tests if, uh, if you haven't done it in, a, in that kind of strategic way. All right, hopefully that was clear. Speaking of vignettes, uh, we have a question about the interior layout. 
Uh, the interior layout, um, this is the, this is sort of a long question here, uh, what is the most efficient way to size each room quickly and accurately since there aren't any dimensions or square footage given for each room? I've had issues where I thought it was a good layout until I put the furniture in and needed to rearrange room sizes to fit the furniture and it takes up uh, a lot of unnecessary time. So yeah, absolutely, this is a, this is a really interesting question. Um, the interior layout, just to kind of put a little bit of background on it. So this is under schematic design. There's the two, uh, the two uh, vignettes and schematic design is the, uh, the building design and then there's the interior layout. The building design is this huge, big project and it takes uh, many hours and you have a lot of information to get through. Uh, and it's one of those things that uh, everybody gears up for and you get all psyched up for. And then there's this little puny little interior layout thing. You just got to put some furniture in and make a couple uh, office space things. And you have uh, you know a little bit of time for that, and it seems like it's a really nothing little vignette compared to the schematic design. I guarantee you, the interior layout is harder than the schematic design, and the reason for that is because you have to do it fast, and there's not a lot of space. You things, everything is very tight, and there's only really a couple ways that it can be laid out. So, given that, uh, the the first couple things I would say, uh, one is practice, practice, practice. Right, so uh, there are ways that you can make, uh, have an understanding about how to do these things um, by just the more times you've tried it, uh, the faster you will be at sort of foreseeing what the issues are. There actually is quite a bit of information about dimensions as you're, as you're putting the rooms in. And so you can very easily see if it's a 10 foot distance or if it's an eight foot distance or something like that uh, for the room as you place it in. Uh, and so one of the things that as you're doing that, you should have already by practicing, you should already have a number of key dimensions kind of built into your brain about this. So for example, if I have a five foot desk uh, with a chair and a three foot passageway next to it, well, that's eight feet, right? Now I wanna probably give myself a little room, so I probably should think of that as about eight, six. And then I very easily can, can imagine if I've put an office in and I have, say, 15 feet left, I am not gonna be able to get two offices next to each other that both have a passageway and a desk in that orientation. So this is just one of those things, there's just a few of these numbers you wanna kind of have in the back of your head where it's assemblies of furniture uh, because it's going to show up over and over again. Uh, and if you kind of think of it that way, then you can look for key dimensional elements and just sort of know what's coming. Another possibility, uh, some folks that I've talked to have sworn by this, it seems a little goofy to me, but uh, I've practiced it a little bit and it seemed to make sense and, and like I said, they swore by it. Uh, what they did is they would put um, the furniture out first uh, so they would make what they thought was like a reasonable arrangement of furniture. So let's say there's an executive desk with its chair and, uh, you know, here's a back uh, bookshelf and uh, here's a chair for a visitor and there's a side table or something, I don't know, you know, something like that. And then once they sort of make that uh, in as tight and reasonable, uh, <coughs> excuse me, as tight and reasonable a uh, uh, grouping of furniture that they thought was reasonable, uh, they would then um, come back through and put the room around it. That's a terrible room, sorry. Um, but uh, what that allows them to do is to understand the scale of the room uh, by what it needs to be in terms of how much furniture is sort of being jammed in there. And pretty quickly, you sort of put those things together, and then you look at those rooms, and you start moving them around a little bit on the actual uh, drawing plane, and it becomes pretty clear pretty fast that, okay, that's, that's a, you know, th that orientation of desks isn't going to work, or uh, this is taking up too much space, or I can't get those three in a row, so therefore I must have to switch it around. Um, and it's just sort of one other way of approaching it. Now, is that the best way for you? Oh, you have to practice it. You have to test it out. But uh, this is why I'm saying was saying earlier. It's like use this um, this vignette as a way to test different ways of doing uh, these things. Like try it one way and then do it again and try it the other way. 
Uh, do you like uh, just memorizing dimensions and then kind of picturing those in your head and then putting the rooms in and then filling it with furniture? Or do you like putting the furniture down, grouping them in logical ways, and then putting the rooms around them and then moving the rooms into place? Um, they're both totally reasonable and rational ways to do it. Some people will prefer one over the other. Uh, but th those are the best ways to really think about it, is definitely just memorize a few of those key dimensions, uh, but then also test out this idea of putting in the furniture first uh, and see if that is helpful for you. Okay, moving on to something a little different. Uh, pretty straightforward question. What light types uh, work well outdoors? Uh, and the f main response here is not fluorescent. Um, HIDs, which are high intensity discharge, which are essentially the same basic idea as a fluorescent, they have the same basic mechanism um, in them, uh, actually do better than a regular fluorescent. I'm not really sure why they do better uh, in the cold, uh, but neither of them is particularly great in the cold. Fluorescents definitely are the most problematic. Uh, strangely, um, incandescent bulbs, which are you know, the, the bulb of last resort these days because they're just so unbelievably inefficient, um, are just fine outdoors. They do very well indeed. In fact, uh, they kick out so much heat that they, uh, you can actually warm up a screen porch just by having a couple incandescent bulbs uh, out, uh, outdoors and uh, actually use the heat in some interesting way. Um, people actually do that in basements and things. They'll leave lights on and that's one of the ways they keep the, the basement heated. Um, so incandescent bulbs are great outdoors. They just have all kinds of other problems. They're incredibly inefficient. They uh, produce a massive amount of heat uh, and uh, not that much light. Probably the best one for outdoors are LEDs, um, at least the current uh, version of, of all these different lights. Um, LEDs do just fine um, uh, in, the, in the cold weather. There's, uh, there are a bunch of kind of odd aspects to LEDs that uh, are still, frankly, being kind of worked out. Um, one of them is that LEDs don't actually produce very much heat, which is great because when they light, when a, a lamp produces heat, uh, that's usually, like for example in the incandescence, that means there's a lot of energy going into producing the heat that's not going into producing light. And so the fact that the LEDs don't produce very much heat is, is a great sign that they're efficient. Um, however, they are susceptible to heat issues. Um, so weirdly, I, my one worry would not be LEDs in the winter, my one worry would be LEDs uh, actually in the summer. But I, I actually don't know that that's a problem. I just know that they are susceptible to too much heat. And that's why often when you, when you look at the LEDs that are supposed to fit into, uh, like the ones that are supposed to look like a regular bulb, um, you know, they'll have the uh, sort of odd fins on them. I don't know if you've ever seen those. Uh, and then the, the bulb part that uh, screws in. <laughs> A terrible bulb, but you get the idea. Um, and those fins are there in order to help dissipate the heat away uh, from the, the actual LED source. And so the, the thing there is they don't produce that much heat, but if you allow the heat that they do produce to stay right there, uh, it will uh, degrade the, um, the light source. It'll degrade the, the thing, and it won't actually have the long-lasting life that everybody uh, keeps talking about for LEDs. This is a big deal, uh, especially when you're replacing LEDs into things like uh, can lights or something where the heat doesn't have a chance to uh, get away. Uh, and uh, the, the other big issue there is because LEDs are so long lasting that one of the things people have started doing is they've started putting them in, in fixtures in a way, in uh, luminaires in a way, that uh, you can't actually get to to replace because the idea is, well, you're not really ever going to have to replace it. It's going to be, by the time you're replacing it, you're going to be ripping out the reception desk anyway or something. It'll be, you know, years and years down the road. Well, that's true unless it builds up a lot of heat, at which point it's going to degrade and it'll run out much, much faster. So there's some weird things going on with LEDs about um, cool and heat, but essentially they're probably the best for the outdoors. Uh, HIDs uh, like mercury vapors and uh, uh, sodium uh, lights uh, do just fine uh, and they're very, very efficient. Um, 
uh, for street lamps and for uh, you know parking lots and all of those things. But if you were actually looking at it really closely, I think they flicker a little bit and they start to go down when it gets uh, uh, dimmed down a little bit when it gets really, really cold. Um, I, for whatever reason, I don't think it's as bad as fluorescence. Fluorescence often just won't even come on if it's cold. So hopefully that's a reasonable, cl reasonably clear. Let's jump to the next one. Sort of similar related one. Uh, which uh, lights, lamps uh, generate the least pollution? So, okay, this is a really simple, straightforward, logical question, but it's actually a painfully complicated answer because it totally depends on the kind of question that would actually be coming at you. My guess is, is that the simplest answer to this would be the LEDs. Uh, that the LEDs have, um, uh, prob because they're very efficient, you know, generally, um, uh, you, because they're sort of small, you can put them very close uh, to the, the place where you want the light. Uh, so you can actually, not only are they efficient, but you can use them efficiently. Um, so there's a bunch of reasons why the LEDs are probably the reasonable answer to which lamps pr produce the, the least pollution. However, um, if you actually really want to dig deep into it, uh, there's quite a lot of weird stuff in uh, LEDs. There's a lot of metals and things and the process of making them uh, is actually a little bit at question uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it's, they're essentially computer components, if you will, and then they have the same sets of issues that, uh, that all the you know, people who are making iPhones and computers and all those things have, which they have all these sort of odd, uh, hard to find uh, materials in them. Uh, and the process, the clean room process of that, that stuff generates a lot of pretty nasty stuff. Uh, so if you're looking at it in a really big picture way, LEDs actually have some complications. Fluorescents are pretty good in terms of their efficiency. Uh, people uh, talk a lot about the LEDs, but I actually don't think if you really tested apples to apples, I think you, they're, a, they're pretty much neck and neck between um, uh, fluorescents, HIDs, and LEDs. Uh, so all of those use, uh, uh, are, are pretty efficient. So then comes the question of, well, what does efficient mean? And efficient really is the term, uh, term of use, the term of art for lighting efficiency is efficacy. And that idea of efficacy is I have a certain amount of watts and I'm generating a certain amount of lumens. And so anything that I can use sort of a smaller uh, number of watts uh, to get me to uh, you know the lumen amount that I need, uh, you know that's the smallest number of watts. This is the smallest amount of power. Uh, that's what I'm looking for to do. Is I want to get the, the the lowest watts to get the maximum lumens. But when it really comes down to it, uh, architects don't really care about lumens. Uh, lumens are the amount of light leaving a luminaire, the amount of light leaving a fixture, right? So it's important, but what architects really care about, engineers care about lumens. What architects care about is foot candles. So foot candles is how much light is actually hitting a square footage of surface, of desk, of uh, reading materials, of the, the walkways, of the walls with the paintings on them. So what we generally care about is does the light get to where it wants to be? And so I can potentially have a very efficient uh, watt to lumen ratio, but if it creates a really bright light that's gonna be uh, glary and blinding, then I'm gonna put a shade over it. And then I've, just by putting that shade over it or that diffuser over it, I have immediately lessened its the actual foot candles that are gonna to get to the desk for my ability to read. So these things get very complicated. I suddenly have to have more lumens coming out because I still have to shade them or, or dim them in some way to make it more pleasant for, for me as a, as a user. So uh, it's a complicated thing. The main thing that I would say is think about what the question is actually asking you. What's the point of what they're talking about? For example, CFLs, compact fluorescents, very reasonable, very efficient, 
uh, use um, very low uh, levels of, of power of watts in order to generate a fairly high lumen uh, count. And the way that they're doing the phosphors these days, you can actually get pretty good uh, range of color, uh, light color. Uh, but compact fluorescence, like all uh, fluorescent systems, uh, the way that the fluorescent works is there's a tube, there's an electrical arc that goes through that tube. Uh, that electrical arc stimulates uh, some mercury that's in the tube. The mercury then gives off uh, UV light, and the UV light then, uh, which we can't see, so it's not useful to us, uh, makes the phosphors that are on the tube, the glass tube itself, light up. So it's this very weird process uh, that it, it goes through that, that whole big thing. Uh, and it, but like I said, it's very efficient, but you may have noticed I said mercury. So that means uh, every time you throw out a CFL into the garbage, there's a little tiny bit of mercury that's going into the landfill, that's going into the water table. Uh, and we are sort of slowly poisoning ourselves uh, through this. In the old days, when fluorescents were always just the four foot or the eight foot tubes, and that's how people used fluorescents, and they were all in schools and in office buildings and things like that, there was always a janitor or somebody who took care of it. And so they would take them down and give them back to the people they bought them from. And so it was very controlled. Once it became sort of a, a popular out in the field thing, like everybody, everybody's house, everybody's grandmother has uh, CFLs in their house now. Well, now the, that ability to control the recycling isn't going so well. So again, it depends on how the question is coming at you. If it's something about things like mercury or the way that uh, recycling systems work, CFLs are a real problem. But in the big abstract, uh, CFLs are very, uh, so much better than incandescents that they're a great, great resource for the country. So it's complicated. Okay. Next one, what species of wood uh, are useful for exterior uses? Uh, so there's a couple different uh, ways to think about this. Um, most wood that you're gonna use exterior, most of the time is actually gonna have a, a pretty serious finish on it. Um, usually painting it, actually. Sometimes with a stain, sometimes with a, uh, what's referred to as an opaque stain. Um, uh, the thinner the stain, the less opaque it is, uh, the less protection it's going to be for the wood. Um, uh, and the, the wood that's, that's exterior is fighting a very serious battle. Uh, not only is there uh, all that uh, moisture uh, that's going to be attacking that wood, but there's also UV rays. Uh, there's also really dramatic uh, changes in temperature. Um, the, you know, there's a whole series of different issues that are going on. There's insects. Um, all of these different things uh, are going to be attacking the wood. And so you really want to give the wood as, sort of as, as best its ability to, to withstand all of that as you can. But then certain species of wood actually do pretty well exterior. Uh, and I'm going to break them down into sort of two basic categories. The first one is kind of typical use wood. Uh, so this would be stuff like the western red cedar, um, uh, cypress, redwood. Um, all of those three are examples of uh, woods that you can get pretty easily. Uh, and they're great for making fences. They're great for siding. They're great for uh, arbors and trellises and things like that that are, that are going to get uh, um, all of that kind of UV and water and moisture issues and all of that because they naturally uh, have abilities uh, in, through different ways, partly through densities, but uh, also through um, just like tannins and some other, other stuff in there that, that make that particular species uh, resistant to those issues. Uh, so uh, those are the three that come up all the time in sort of typical, uh, you can get them at Home Depot kind of ways, like you can, you can buy that fairly simply and easily. Uh, they're not great at it. They're just a lot better than, than Doug fir or Southern Pine or something like that. Uh, so the, you know, they'll, they'll last for a long time, they won't last forever. And it depends on, on the exposure level. Some of the other ones that are a little bit more special, a little bit more expensive, 
Um, I'm not 100% sure about Black Locust. I know I've used it in some outdoor stuff. I actually don't really remember how expensive it was. Um, but white oak, uh, and then starting to get into um, probably Ipe, uh, or it's a Brazilian wood, uh, is probably the next one. Teak and then mahogany are, you know, those are starting to get pretty expensive. Ipe has been used a lot recently, and uh, you can find it usually, um, but you're not going to find huge amounts of it. Teak, it's very hard to get large amounts of. But if you're doing something smaller, uh, it's incredibly effective uh, in exterior use. Uh, mahogany is the same way. Uh, again, you're going to have a hard time getting a lot of mahogany, uh, but, uh, or at least it would be very expensive. Um, but teak and mahogany are going to be amazing uh, from their ability to last a long, long time, if, especially if they're given at least a little bit of protection. Uh, the ipe will also last a very long time. White oak is very, very dense and will last uh, a, a pretty good long time. Um, those are going to be uh, much more expensive than the western red cedar or the cypress or the redwood, uh, but they will also last a lot longer and, and have a, probably a better finish. Uh, and then obviously the other, uh, what type of species of wood? Well, treated would be the species of wood that uh, is probably the, uh, the most used. Um, and so that's where they, they take the, the pretty standard wood. I think it's usually southern pine or something, southern yellow pine, something like that. Um, and they jam it full of uh, chemicals. Um, these days, I think it's the ACQ. I, I might have that backwards. It might be AQC. I think it's ACQ, um, which is a it has a kind of copper something. It used to be arsenic, and now they've taken they got rid of the arsenic ones. Although there are still some states that I think you can still buy the the old version that has the arsenic. Um, uh, which obviously, if you're dealing with treated wood, don't cut it in a basement, don't breathe it in a lot, you know, all of that, like, make sure you're in a ventilated space because uh, it's pretty nasty materials. Some bootleg wood. Yeah, some bootleg wood. It was actually one of my favorite uh, uh, New York Times articles ever. I mean, I'm sure it was a horrible experience for the people, but uh, was uh, this guy had gotten arrested for attempted murder of his wife uh, because she had gone into the hospital with arsenic poisoning, and it took them a really long time to figure out that it turns out they were just building a deck and he was outside building it, and she was in the basement cutting all the pieces to the order to the size that he told her to cut. And so she was in this space, this unventilated space, and was uh, uh, inhaling, inhaling uh, arsenic for the whole thing. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a nasty material, and you can't do anything, like you can't use it in organic spaces or anything like that. Uh, but treated is very, very cheap comparatively to any of those other choices. Uh, and then there's some some trickier, fancier ones. There's like uh, there's ones that I, I haven't personally used, but like it's like a, there's a whole new categories of like thermo wood where they they heat set them in some way. Um, they're they're kind of uh, they're not just regular pieces of wood. They're these sort of uh, um, uh, they've been messed with, if you will. Uh, and then there's uh, many of you have probably seen uh, like Trex decking. Um, that's a brand name, uh, but it's essentially uh, a material where they take old milk bottles and uh, sawdust and they make uh, kind of wood decking out of it. And uh, it's a, I, I love that material. I think it's really uh, useful. Uh, it's very good in the exterior. It doesn't uh, expand and contract in the same way that wood does. It's not going to deal with water in the same way, but you can still cut it with a uh, skill saw. Uh, it's uh, relatively easy to install. It's a, Pretty pricey, but um, makes a really great, great deck. Um, the true cradle-to-cradle uh, -cradle, uh, folks hate those materials because once you put the milk jugs with the uh, wood sawdust, you can never separate them out again. Um, so, from if you're if you're the uh, purist uh, when it comes to sustainability, uh, uh, there's a reason not to like them. But uh, to me, they have very, very long lasting. They're very, uh, you can get nice colors and everything. Like I, I think they're a great bet. So there's, there's ways to think about this from like using actual woods and, and understanding what the different uh, species are. But then there's also ways to think about this as like, well, what, what would you use instead of wood, right? Uh, and that's where we get into those sort of treated and those elements. All right, we just ran through all of our our questions. Beautiful. Um, does anybody, um, uh, does anybody who's tuned in right now have any other questions they'd like to pose uh, for Mike while we have them here? Uh, we'll hold for just a moment here um, and see if anyone has any other questions. 
Uh, in the meantime, thanks everybody for, uh, for submitting your questions. I hope that uh, uh, this was a good opportunity for you to kind of, uh, you know, um, <laughs> get Mike uh, on the hot seat and get any of your <laughs> questions answered. So um, I don't see any questions coming through right now. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll close our session right there. So thank you, Mike. And thanks again to all of you who've tuned in and who have submitted their questions today. Uh, if you'd like to attend our next ARE Live broadcast on the Structural Systems Exam, visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register to attend. Uh, and just like today's episode, you'll have a chance to ask questions uh, and share your answers with Mike for live feedback during the broadcast. And if I can just toss in, if you have uh, a particular topic that you think would be uh, good to cover uh, on that, let us know. If you let us know early enough, we'll make sure we get it in there uh, for the uh, discussion next time. Yep, and um, uh, to learn a little bit more about our AIA ARE prep curriculum, go to blackspectacles.com uh, where you can try out any of the free courses. And for those of you who are, who are ready to start preparing for the ARE, uh, and if you're already an AIA member, um, as a part of our partnership with the AIA, you can visit uh, http colon slash slash bksp.es slash ARE Prep 826 to get a 15% discount of your AIA ARE Prep membership. Finally, please leave a comment below the video to let us know what you think and share any suggestions you may have. I promise we'll read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.